When the Spaniards first sailed to Manila over 400 years ago, it was little more than a small settlement of 2,000 people. With continual growth, the metropolitan area has sprawled to include five cities and 11 municipalities. Today, Metro Manila is home to over 8 million people. By the year 2000, it will be the 18th largest city in the world. To keep pace with this growth, new investments have been made in roads, like the new C5 Expressway and in the expanded light rail transit system. The private sector is leading the way with the conversion of a former military camp, Fort Bonifacio, into a new 214 hectare central business district designed at world-class standards. Gains are also being made on the environmental front. Open garbage dumps such as Smoky Mountain have been closed, replaced with safe sanitary landfills that are properly sited outside the city. green movement has tackled the thousands of poorly maintained vehicles that ply the city streets. Stiff penalties are imposed upon those who ignore the law. One of the most laudable efforts, and possibly the most difficult, is the ongoing cleanup of the Pasig River. It's a very important part of Filipino life, the Pasig River has been historically related to our life, to our trade, to our recreation. With the decline of the river as a means of transportation and with population pressure, the river really became a, a, a backdoor of sort. It became a convenient, uh, really, uh, large toilet bowl for a large segment of the population. And now we have this gigantic sore Right, go, going right through Metro Manila, from Laguna de Bay to Manila Bay, and it's, it's just one big mock in the middle of a bustling city. Historically, there is a three-meter easement along the Pasig uh, banks, but look at it now, it's a massive problem. All the industries are encroaching uh, on the banks of the Pasig River. We've got more than 12,000 squatter families along the river system alone. And with that, they're contributing to the dumping of solid waste. Besides the squatters, we also have these other communities um, in the river basin. And they dump their liquid waste here also. Their sewage, uh, they all go through the uh, drainage pipes because we don't have a central sewage system for most of Metro Manila. What we have now is a situation where the environment is already taking a beating. Uh, you have mo much of the river system uh, already biologically dead. Add on to this a nearly 3% growth every year, and you have a situation wherein it is going to be very difficult, perhaps uh, even uh, almost impossible in the short term to address. The Pasig River Rehabilitation Program is intended to be a 15-year program. Right now, we have the Philippine Coast Guard helping us out. We have um, agencies like the National Housing Authority. Even the industries are involved in this. They have, they're now establishing waste treatment plants. They're starting to treat their waste so that they would not dump so much into the Pasig River and damage it further. The Philippine Business for Social Progress put together a committee uh, for the environment, especially on the Pasig River. And we thought of bringing together government, NGOs, and uh, businessmen. The pollution of uh, the industries around the Pasig River is the one that we are worried about because there are around 3,000 industries along the banks of the Pasig River, and there are around 200 to 300 identified polluters. This business plan is the blueprint for the future. It started, it may not be all implemented, it will take us 
maybe 15 to 20 years to really achieve uh, the full cleanup of the Pasig River. It takes $40 million per year to really clean it up. And for the next uh, 15 to 20 years, we probably will be spending around uh, $400 million to $500 million. We're launching the Piso Para Sa Pasig this July to put together funds uh, for the cleanup of the Pasig River. And it will involve donations coming from students up to the most established industry in the country. So if every Filipino will contribute a peso, we should be able to raise 60 million pesos. The problem of the Pasig River is nobody owns the Pasig River. What we're recommending is a Pasig River Authority that can really look after the Pasig River, that someone that can raise the money, someone that can really uh, police all those who are dumping their effluents into the Pasig River, and someone who can receive grants so that it will have enough money to take care of the Pasig River. This is Rockwell Plant. It's a 15 and a half hectare property right in Makati. Uh, one side of the property is along the Pasig River. The plant has been in, uh, in operation as a power plant until last August when they, they shut it down. The developers, the landowners, they're planning to, to put up here a mixed-use development integrating uh, place of residence and place of work to place of shopping to place of business. The, the change in land use from what used to be a pollutant uh, power plant into a more friendly development uh, will, we hope, will initiate new developments, particularly the pollutant industries along the Pasig River. One way by which we can reframe the issue of the Pasig River is to make this into the front instead of the backyard, because right now it's being used as a backyard. So as a backyard, that's where you dump everything. If you use the three meter easement and make this into a uh, civic place where social activities can take place, like uh, the procession or the fiesta, town fiestas, then this is going to be a very beautiful place. It's, uh, it's a dream, really, because this is an ambitious task. We're not saying you can do it, but we'd like to hope so. In the last three decades or so, while I've been involved in the Asian urban development process, I have seen small cities grow bigger and the bigger cities grow into mega cities. In the process, while some of these cities have faced massive problems of environmental degradation, of pollution, of poverty, but at the same time, we have seen several examples of success. What we have right now is a question of urban management and that the orientation that we're pursuing in places like Delhi to, pr to try to provide the infrastructure that's required is to look at it as an urban management problem. Now if we take that as opposed to a project specific kind of program, it has all kinds of influences over the kinds of support that you present to the institutions, the local people, the technicians, the politicians, all of that. The, the problem is that, that the local governments in the region have not had much involvement in development until now. Most development has occurred as a result of the effort of nas national government agencies. And this has worked well when cities were small and problems were simple. There is throughout the region, and especially in India, through the Nagarpalika law, interest in having local authorities regain the authority and the responsibilities that it once had to be able to provide the basic services that each of the cities now requires. To accomplish these objectives, we need to work with communities and we need strong leadership. Leadership from our governors, from our planners, from our managers. It will no longer be the center to provide, through subsidies or through grants, sufficient monies for any of these cities to be able to provide the services for themselves. So it's going to be the responsibility of getting into a financial market knowing that their programs are commercially viable at least to be able to recuperate the resources, pay back the loans, so they can continue to work. And that's where it's going to have to go. We can't waste any resources.
Throughout history, cities have fueled mankind's creativity and ambition. By bringing people together, by spurring initiative and innovation, our cities have strengthened our sense of place and community. Here, in these cities under siege in the developing world, small but real gains are being made. Will they ever be able to meet the increasing demands being placed on them? Only time will tell.